welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. It's all about fixing your marriage without your man's conscious efforts so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm talking about how to use your feminine gifts in marriage, part one. My guest Sharon had lost all respect for her husband because of his anger issues, which affected the whole family. When they weren't in a cold war, they were arguing. He was rarely home or involved with the family, and she was fantasizing about divorce. But when Sharon made a few changes, he became much less angry. The kids even stopped asking her why dad was angry all the time. He started being home more. He started expressing gratitude to her. He became more giving and helpful. She's going to tell us exactly what she did to create that peace and cooperation at home so that you can do it too. And then the worst advice of the week award winner is very popular, but somewhat incoherent and has terrible advice that I wouldn't want you to fall for. All that's coming up. But first, I'm going to talk about how to use your feminine gifts in marriage, part one. As a woman, you were born to be cherished by a man. That's your birthright. And at one time, you took that for granted. You probably started fantasizing about it when you were little and dreaming about the moment you would finally meet or kiss or fall in love with and marry a cute boy. And you anticipated with great pleasure how much he would desire you and how he would woo you. You spoke to your friends and your sisters and your mom about the nature of boys and marveled at how strange they are. And you delighted in romantic movies and books where the boy got the girl. You might have obsessed or developed crushes. They, they went nowhere. You agonized. You debated. And all of that was preparation for your job as keeper of the relationship. Sure, you suffered disappointments and challenges in relationships, mostly because you didn't know about your superpowers as a woman. If your relationship isn't all you dreamed it would be, this is the missing piece that you need. But what are the gifts of the feminine and how can you use them to create lasting love? Well, I'm glad you asked. I happen to have this list of four gifts I wanted to share with you. Number one is that women have the power to receive special treatment. I love this quote from Marilyn Monroe who says that women who seek equality with men lack ambition. And one big aspect of our gifts is receptivity. It's receptivity, which is how willing you are to receive compliments, gifts, help, apologies, and special treatment. It's so subtle. You might not notice receptivity if you don't know what to look for. A receptive woman is inevitably a well-taken-care-of woman. Her man takes every opportunity to do things that he knows are going to please her. He memorizes her favorite dessert. He opens the door for her. He puts gas in the car, charges her electric car. He tells her she's beautiful and he brings her flowers. He also does the dishes and he gives the baby a bath and he works to support the family. And in return, she smiles and says, thank you. That's it. She's genuinely grateful. She doesn't rebuff his offers so she can stay independent or try to even the score. And she doesn't criticize the way he bathes the baby either. Because that would be leaving her power by trying to control him, which would weaken them both. So to stay in her power, she receives what he offers graciously. And her man gets a lot out of it because he feels purposeful and successful at pleasing her. And they both benefit from their interaction. You probably enjoyed this kind of virtuous cycle during the early days of your relationship when you were falling in love and you both felt amazing. In the past, I might have observed such a woman where her man was taking such good care of her and said something like, well, how is she getting that kind of treatment? But I was missing the whole point, which is that she was taken care of because she was willing to be taken care of. That brings out a man's natural desire to please his woman. And you have the same ability to inspire a man's devotion, but you may not have been tapping into it. Chances are no one ever gave you feminine training. This is completely different from 
assertiveness training that we got at work where you instruct people to do what you want them to do. And that can never be as satisfying in a romance because your man doesn't want to feel like your employee. And part of what we want is for our men to want to please us. And barking orders is no substitute for genuine romance. Nothing causes the same butterflies of excitement as knowing that he's pursuing you because he finds you irresistible and he's taking care of you because you inspire him. Not that you need anyone to take care of you. You can always take care of yourself. But it feels good to see a man who's devoted to you making big gestures and small gestures just to delight you, just for the pleasure of seeing you smile, seeing you beam, seeing you happy. I can be independent, but it's even more gratifying to be interdependent. That doesn't make me weaker. Quite the contrary. Having a man's attention and help, it's fortifying. Number two, women have more power in the bedroom. We women, we're the gatekeepers of sex from the very beginning of the relationship. It's up to the woman to say, not yet or not now, because men usually need sex more than women do. So if your husband doesn't seem that interested in sex lately, it very likely has to do with him not feeling respected. But I digress. Because in my experience, men will go a long way to make sure that his wife is not upset with him to avoid the unpleasant consequence of not being able to have sex. And that's not his only motivation. His natural desire is to please his woman. And that's compounded by his desire to keep his one and only sex partner happy. And keeping us happy, as you know, is not always that easy to do. My husband has had the audacity to try to make love to me right when I'm very busy and I, I'm stressing out. And, and he is probably right that it, w- it would help relieve stress to make love. And whether we do or not is, of course, up to me, just like it's always up to you. That's because we've got the power. Whether they want to keep the sex coming or, or they want to please us. Uh, guys do things that women want them to do, even if they don't want to do them. And they don't do things that women don't want them to do, even though they want to do them. And that's a lot of power. There are two more ways that you have enormous power to keep your marriage thriving and avoid divorce, no matter how lonely and broken it is right now, which I'll share with you next week in part two of this podcast about how to use your feminine gifts in marriage. In the meantime, consider experimenting with your feminine gifts by receiving graciously and opening the gate to physical intimacy as much as possible. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. My guest Sharon had lost all respect for her husband because of his anger issues, which affected the whole family. When they weren't in a cold war, they were arguing. He was rarely home or involved with the family, and she was fantasizing about divorce. But when Sharon made a few changes, he became much less angry. The kids even stopped asking her why dad was angry all the time. He started being home more. He started expressing gratitude to her. He became more giving and helpful. And she is going to tell us what she did to create that peace and cooperation at home so you can do it too. Sharon, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. I'm excited to hear your story today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So take us to the battle days. What was happening at your house? Wow. I started giving advice the minute my husband's feet hit the floor the morning after our wedding, almost 29 years ago. And I wondered, 
why the air suddenly frosted over on that warm June day. I didn't understand it. I mean, I was young, I was immature, okay. But I thought I knew all about how to be a good wife, which meant being helpful. But I didn't know that my suggestions were perceived as controlling and critical and that they were totally unwelcome. Um, So really the excitement, infatuation, we had shared goals and vision. We cherished that during our very brief courtship and that just faded right away the day after our wedding and just mutated into hostility, mistrust, cold war, silence. Um, I didn't know how to listen to his thoughts and ideas. I felt that they would threaten me from getting my way. Um, So my fear came out as anger. I yelled, I cried. I said awful things like I hated him. And my husband put up a wall that closed himself off from me emotionally. It was so painful. Um, He came home late at night and I would sit and wait, count down the minutes until he walked through the door. And by the time he came in, I would pounce on him full of complaints, how lonely I was and disappointed in him. And I just thought maybe he didn't know how great I was. Um, (laughs) Instead of searching for how great he was and his good qualities, I tried to prove to him how smart or capable I was, or I had to point out how hard I worked, how tired I was, or how much I did, what a martyr I was, and how much he should appreciate me and take care of me and dote on me. I was starving for his approval and compliments, but it didn't work. My neediness, competitiveness, they just repelled him. And um, it just spiraled into Cold War fights. Um, But we, we were able to like pretend Like we were cordial to each other um, unless we had to talk about an issue. And then it was, got very tense. I would, I would get nervous and tense just thinking about having to hear him out. I just couldn't handle it. I would cut him off as he was speaking. I was so scared of not getting what I wanted. And we would have explosive arguments or discussions Um, And they just went around and around and around going nowhere and just full of blame, full of bitterness. I would complain that he wasn't affectionate, that he wasn't communicative, that he wasn't honest with me. Um, And I just thought I'd be happy if only he would improve. Um, And And did that ever, did you ever get a better (laughs) response? No, no. (laughs) Never did. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, um, he just uh, got pushed further and further away as a result of that. He he didn't have any desire to be close to me at all. Mm -hmm. Which hurts, right? So feels very lonely. Very lonely. I was so alone. I mean, I had a bunch of little kids and I was desperate for his companionship, for his help just to feel like he was my partner and he didn't really want to be around me. And what was even more painful was he was really warm and loyal to his friends. He would go to great lengths to support them. There were times of need or in their times of joy, he was there for them. He was like a different person. And I was so insanely jealous of that, that his dedication, his attention to them. I didn't get any of that. It was terrible. So even worse, because you you knew he he had it in him. Exactly. Never directed at you. Yeah. Yeah. I saw it and it was, I was, it was like watching it from afar. It was so painful. I just thought it was a mistake. Our our marriage had been a mistake. We just like put on this front, like we were happy, but like behind closed doors, it was like we despised each other. It was like a living a lie. Wow. And it was all his fault. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely all his fault. 100%. And, um, and you tried to get him to straighten up and that wasn't working. What, what else did you try to fix your marriage? Um, well, 
I worked on myself a lot. I, I, I really, I had a lot of troubles. <laughs> with, I, I went through a lot. I had a lot of coping mechanisms. I turned to a lot of unhealthy behaviors um, as a result. I don't know if as a result, but I just, I worked on myself. I ended up in recovery from addiction and I worked so hard on self-improvement, um, filling myself up, working on my, you know, inner self, my spiritual work. I had a community of support and I really worked so hard on that. And, and despite all of that, my marriage was still my blind spot. Like we still remained distant and we just kind of settled into like a parallel lives. He didn't join me and the kids when we went out on outings. Um, I just ex- stopped expecting it. Like we just kind of settled into this kind of truce. I didn't even tell him what we were doing. We just didn't talk. If we did, it was about what needed to be done just to keep things running smoothly. We had a large family. We have a large family. <laughs> um, and I was the, you know, in charge. I'm very efficient and organized and great at delegating. And, um, you know, it's great at work, but not at home, apparently. Um, and we just, we walked through so many things. I mean, it's like three decades together. We've been through so much life together, but really apart. We wasn't together. It was like parallel. Um, one of our kids faced a life-threatening illness. It was terrifying. It was devastating. And I was just desperate for his support, for reassurance, for care, for just to have his shoulder to lean on, to cry on. But we didn't have that kind of relationship. And um, I just went through it feeling alone. Um, He just kept retreating further and further away into his own hobbies. And I didn't even care. It was like, I just didn't expect anymore to have a close, loving relationship. I just figured that wasn't for me. That's not my lot in life. I'm not going to be cherished. I'm not going to be adored. Not going to happen for me in this life. At least I have amazing kids who give me great joy and they're the true loves in my life. And I'll just be okay with that. Like, you know, we've been like this for decades already and I'm just never going to have a loving, warm life, you know, love life. But then just things got worse. They just kind of spiraled and started to deteriorate terribly over the last five years. Um, I just started to become extremely hyper-focused on all the things he did wrong, big and small, the way he spoke, the way he dressed, his values, his priorities, the way he used his time. It became bigger and bigger, like a monster. Like I just, I couldn't tolerate the way he breathed. I was judgmental and critical of every little thing he said and did and he became so defensive and angry that even if I did happen to compliment or thank him he would respond defensively it was like his knee-jerk reaction was to be defensive and I was disgusted by how thin-skinned he was he just took everything so personally I was like just grow up already and, um, you know, he would just like come home, go straight to sleep, never said hello, goodbye. And I mean, I did too. We just, nothing. There was like no conversation at all. Well, it sounds, it sounds devastating. It sounds like a daily painful, yeah, lonely way to live. So, so what happened? Um, so my kids were constantly asking me, why is dad so angry all the time? They were, they would say anything, do anything. And he would just fly into a rage and, or he was just withdrawn, very, very passive. The home started to just feel so toxic. My husband and son fought. Uh, my son used me as a go-between. He would 
never speak to my husband, anything he wanted. He would ask me and he knew that I would always side with him. Like my, it was like me and my son against my husband. And my husband just like gave up on parenting him. It's a teenage boy, just threw up his hands in defeat. And my teenage daughter, who was just like this wise old soul, very intuitive. She would be like watching me on the sidelines with these like sad eyes. Like, why are you treating dad so disrespectfully? Like, I felt like she was watching me. And I was oh so gosh. mortified. <laughs> so embarrassing. You had a critic right there in your own home. Who It sounds like just uh, just her witnessing what you were doing kind of shed a painful, like you weren't proud of it either, it sounds like. No, but I, I didn't know any other way. No. And I couldn't get no. out of it. I was so no. entrapped in it. So stuck. Yeah. And, but I was terrified that I was scarring them. Like I they were in such a detrimental environment. And they are both amazing, great kids, like valedictorians and you know, popular. They were so good, but emotionally healthy, but living in this horrible environment and I didn't want them to become scarred for life. And I wanted them to be able to create a beautiful home of their own one day. And I have married kids and they have beautiful marriages. And I would look at them and be like, how did they have such amazing marriages? Where did this come from? I would literally be jealous of my married kids, like looking at their marriages and be like, why can't I have a marriage like that? And like, where do they learn that? It was crazy, like so crazy. But and I would, I would count, I didn't want to get a divorce because of the consequences for my kids, like the stigma for my kids. But I was always counting down the years in my mind, like, you know, mentally, like, okay, this one will probably get married at this age. And that one will probably get married at that age. And then we could get divorced. Get a calendar for 10 years from now or something. Exactly. You're like, oh, totally. yeah, this awesome. day. In 2036, I'll I'll finally be able to get divorced. It sounds like it was yeah, kinda... and I'll be this old, and if I just like exercise every day, I'll still be attractive, and I'll be able to find the love of my life then. And yeah, I had it all planned out, and uh, it was pathetic. Um, but then my husband moved into the guest room, and then it felt like a divorce, sort of. It was. It felt like he was moving out of the house just like without the technical difficulties or the expense. Cause like, anyway, I thought he was so cheap. Like he couldn't even actually move out. Like, yeah, yeah, the best yeah. Room, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> but I felt so hurt when he did that. I was surprised mm-hmm. that I felt so, it was so painful for me when he did that. Um, it just felt so real, so final. So it, it was devastating. And also I was really ashamed. Like my kids are not young and like they could see him, you know, like moving into the guest room and it, it just was wrong. It was just bad. And, um, I was praying for years, begging, crying, pleading, asking God for help with this. Like, I didn't know what to do. I, I just, I, I was trying so many things. I read so many books, but I just couldn't, I couldn't get better. I, I just couldn't improve. I knew that God had given me this husband for a reason, that it wasn't a mistake. And I realized that my real true growth as a person was with overcoming this challenge. I just did everything that I could. I spoke to friends, but things were just getting worse and worse. Um, We went to counseling and there was one positive thing that came from that. Um, She told him that we should buy gifts for each other. He had not bought me gifts since like the first year we were married. And of course I had hated that gift that he gave me and I rejected it and he never bought me anything since it had been like over 20 something, seven years or whatever, since he had bought me anything. And, um, I mean, what I really wanted for her was to tell him what a jerk he was and that he should change. And I just want her to take my side. She didn't do that. 
but at least he started buying me stuff. But mm. even then, I, I didn't know how to receive it graciously. But um, but that was one thing. But other than that, it was not beneficial. And um, yeah, we discontinued the the counseling. And um, I remember once, like after one of those sessions, he said to me, he said, I just want to make you happy, but oh. I don't think I have the ability to do that. I don't think I'm the one for you. And I, I agreed. I mean, I was like, yeah, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think you can make me happy either. Oh. Um, uh, yeah. Ouch for both of you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there's a lot of hopelessness. Lot yes. Of hopelessness there. Yeah. So counseling wasn't really making the transformation you wanted to have. And uh, you said you'd read books and you were talking to friends and things like that. That wasn't helping either. So you really were so stuck. I mean, you were trapped. All these kids and not wanting to bring any consequences on them. So it just sounds enormously painful. Then what happened? So... I felt like God finally answered my prayers after years. All of a sudden, I started getting so many messages from different people. Um, The first one was my married daughter said out of the blue that she had relinquished control and um, was suddenly like not telling her husband what to do. I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, yeah, I read The Surrendered Wife and da da da. I'm like, oh, I have that book. She's like, yeah, I know you have that book. You know, like I saw it on your shelf like 20 years ago, whatever. I also have it. And I started doing it. I'm like, what? I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe I read that 20 years ago. And I probably like threw it down screaming, you know, (laughs) I'm a women's liver, you know? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) I never incorporated any of that. Um, But that was just like the first little inkling. And then another friend who I spoke to frequently who had been separated and we were um, speaking a lot, who had had a reconciliation, sent me in the mail, The Empowered Wife, and she said, you need to read this. And I started reading it and I was like, wow, like this is quite interesting. And I skimmed through it. Um, A lot of it I couldn't swallow the first time around, like some of it bugged me honestly no offense but yeah no it bugged me too Sharon I felt the same way like what this is crazy yeah like really pushing the finances no not ready for that um I just grew up in the age of women's lib a divorced mother who fed me on a steady diet of rants about what a bum my father was that I should never rely on a man that I could do anything for myself which I did um so yeah, there were parts that bothered me, but a lot that I did enjoy and feel like I could benefit from. Um, and then another friend said um, that she read the book and is practicing the skills. I mean, this is all within like a very short period of time. Like a few different people were like telling me about the book. <laughs> from every angle. Like, yes. <laughs> it's like I'm really your, daughter, I'm your friend, I'm your other friend. <laughs> yeah, amazing. She's practicing the skills and she says that she has been texting the exact same simple words of gratitude to her husband every single morning for years and that he loves it and it's changed their marriage. I was like, wait, what? The exact same sentence? She's like, yeah, the exact same sentence. Like, thank you for, you know, being a great husband and father every day. I was like, you're kidding. Like, I was like, that's ludicrous. Like, that's so simplistic. I mean, I actually, I know her husband. He's like a smart, successful guy. Like, I, I just couldn't believe he would fall for something like that. And that it could be so impactful. <laughs> what a sucker, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I'm like, okay, like it's working for them. I'll try it. So I tried texting gratitudes to my husband for a few days. And he was surprisingly receptive and he started warming up. And the most amazing part was I noticed that I stopped feeling quite so bitter toward him. 
And I was like, whoa, maybe there's something to this. And so it was like kind of dabbling in the skills a little. Um, but really, I just was dabbling. And it took like another year of like descending like further into the abyss. And then another friend recommended that I get a certified Laura Doyle coach. And I was just ready. I was like, yes, like great. I like, I didn't even know about this. And I was like, I'll do anything. I was desperate. So, um, so I did, I got a coach and, um, I just remembered that first session. I like went between being furious that I had to be the one to change and not him. I was just full of resentment. Like, why do I need to do all this work? It's so unfair. So I just cried. (laughs) I cried and cried bitterly to my coach. Um, but I was willing, I was just willing, I was willing to go to any lengths. I was willing to follow directions, even though I was just like acting as if she asked me what I respected about my husband. I said, nothing, nothing, not one. I couldn't think of one thing. She asked me what I was grateful for. I couldn't think of one thing. Um, she told me I needed to apologize. I felt nauseous. Like I, but I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't. <laughs> But I was so desperate. I was utterly hopeless. I mean, apologizing felt excruciating. Like everything was his fault, all of his part. It was so much bigger than mine. But I just was willing and she just walked me through it. And the more I learned about the skills, the truth of the skills just resonated so deeply for me. So I just kept persevering despite a lot of setbacks. Like it didn't come easy. I had so many years of entrenched behaviors and thoughts that it was really, really hard to break out of it. But I just, I started with the general apology, which she helped me craft and he received it very graciously. What did you say? um, I, very simple. I apologize for being disrespectful. And I I think I just left it at that. You know, I don't even remember, honestly, I don't remember what I apologized for being disrespectful, but, you know, like everything for being disrespectful about everything I've ever said to you in 28 years, whatever. Wow. I mean, that's a ton of humility to come from. And I just love this part where you're saying it was so unfair. I was just filled with resentment and bitterness. I just really appreciate hearing that part because I think that is just so human when you've been suffering uh, for so long and you have worked and you have tried to fix it and felt so stuck. And so, uh, yeah, you're just so hurt to have it be so unfair. And then to get to the part where you are humble enough to say, okay, I'm going to clean up my side of the street by apologizing to him for being disrespectful. I mean, who does that? Who does that? Right. Right. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's It's hard. hard. It's hard. It was hard. I mean, yeah. I had made amends to him many times over the years, like as part of my recovery program, you know, my 12 step recovery program, but never anything like this. This was so real. This was like the hardest apology ever, like apologizing for being disrespectful. That just felt really huge. I don't know. I don't know why. It was extremely humbling. How did he respond? He was so grateful and so gracious. And he was like, no, don't worry about it. And like, it was really amazing. He took it really, really gracefully. Yeah. And he wanted to protect you in that moment. Yeah. Wow. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So that was, I felt really safe. Oh, that is awesome. You took a big risk. Yeah. It was pretty surprising. Yeah. Wow. So you apologize for being disrespectful. You were sending him gratitudes. Yeah. The gratitudes were like really um, the big thing for me at the beginning. Um, I just poured on gratitude relentlessly. Um, I started with that. I did three a day. I did, did it them feel really fake at first. Totally fake. Totally fake. 
They were texts. I couldn't do it face to face. I mean, like for a year, I could not do it for, it was just too vulnerable. Like we weren't even having verbal communication at that point. And to say gratitudes out loud, that was crazy. Yeah. Um, my coach helped me to craft them. I, I couldn't even come up with them. And she like, Help me. And they were like long and flowery and descriptive and dramatic. And I would tell them like, not just what I was grateful for, but like how he made me feel. And mm. he just ate them. <laughs> it was amazing. His response was miraculous. And not what you were expecting at all. <laughs> no. How did you think he was going to respond? I thought he would like see through it, like that it was fake, but he took it seriously. Um, and after a while it became a habit. Like I just started to actually notice these things that he was doing, who he was and what he did. I was looking for it and I was able to write them on my own. And even more than that, I began to feel it in my heart no way no No, stop it yeah I actually felt grateful I really 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 did so then it was sincere very sincere really I was changing because of the gratitude I was expressing and so was he he started expressing gratitude to me it was like he was just mirroring me what and he started doing more and more things that elicited gratitude it was just like this positive upward cycle it sounds so like out of the book but it's just true it's just true that's what happened (laughs) it sounds like you still feel some vulnerability about this whole process like oh come on it sounds like too good to be true like this right positive cycle but this is what you experienced because you're willing to you had to stretch a very long way, right? It was an incredible stretch for you to get yeah. to finding anything positive to say. Right. Uh, but it sounds like it, it was huge for him and for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I kept like looking for different aspects of him to be grateful for. First, it was just like very technical. Like, thank you for taking out the garbage. Thank you for cleaning the crock pot. Thank you for driving the kids to their appointment. You know, we make my life so much easier and, you know, I don't have to leave work and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like more like, thank you for who he is, like more like about him and his character and, you know, and how he makes me feel and like really trying to get more you know, into like the deeper aspects. Yeah. Dangerous waters in a way, right? Like Mm -hmm. making it about him, like this guy you've been so unhappy with all this time, but I I admire that so much, Sharon. I think that's, that's inspiring that you did that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What else, what else did you start doing differently than you had been? Um, well, I just was learning a lot. I binged on the podcasts. I mean, I can't even believe I'm on this. I remember listening to them and thinking like, oh my gosh, like, I wonder if I'll ever be on a podcast. That's ludicrous to even think that my marriage is in shambles. It's a joke. It's crazy. And, you know, here I am. Um, but I would, and also I thought that because I would hear women after women describe how they loved their husbands and they wanted them back and they wanted things how they once were. And I just couldn't relate because I didn't love my husband and things had never really been good between us. I mean, except from when we were engaged. So I didn't have anything that I wanted to go back to. So I wasn't sure if this could work for me considering my situation, but like, what choice did I have? I had tried everything else and I didn't want to get divorced today. So. And it was excruciating to stay where you were. So yeah. Yeah. Pain's a good motivator, right? It is a very good motivator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I just, the more I learned, the more astonished I became at how comprehensive, how practical the skills are, how wise this program is and, and how much I needed to change. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had changed and grown so much in my life, but like my brain still needed so much rewiring 
Um, and it just took so much commitment and humility and courage. And it's just so easy to slide back into my old ways, especially if my self-care is low. Um, I have a really full life and it's easy to become overwhelmed. And when I'm not committed to taking care of myself, my perspective changes and I just start back on that path, noticing and picking at everything he does wrong. And the basic foundation for my success with every other skill is making self-care a discipline. And I just cannot afford to skimp on it. And it just, it makes me happy and it makes me light. It makes me humorous. It makes me forgiving. And I just feel like a different person. And it makes me much less critical, much less controlling. It's just great. So what kinds of things do you do for self-care? Um, so I try to go for a walk out in nature every day. I go, like, I do things now that for me felt so decadent. Um, I'll go for a massage. Mm. Um, and um, like, I would get my nails done, but I didn't like it. It wasn't like self-care for me. But I was like, well, if I'm going to do this anyway, I'm going to turn it into self-care. So now I go and I put in my earbuds and I listen to a podcast or I listen to music. I listen, you know, like I'll, I'll do, I'll make it so that I enjoy it. Um, I listen to music. I dance around my kitchen. Like my husband and kids laugh at me. Look at her. Like this old lady, she's <laughs> dancing around the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> so. Cute, but it's playful. This is, he's engaging with you. I mean, that's almost a sign of emotional safety right there because if he was still defensive and angry, he would be able to say that to you. Is that right? Is it? Totally. Yeah. They, I just make them laugh. Yeah. Even at work, like, you know, two o'clock and it's like, everyone is like falling asleep and I'm like, come on girls, let's go in the conference room. We're doing stretches now. (laughs) (laughs) They all just like march behind you like little baby ducks. And then they go and stretch with you because you're, because you're inspiring them. You're it's a, so you're leading them in this area of self-care and everyone, everyone gets happy and smiles more at work. Yeah. And just like modeling it, like for my teenage daughter, like, you know, not feeling guilty, not feeling ashamed, like, okay, you know, I'm going to do my self-care now, like leave me alone, you know, don't (laughs) make me feel guilty about it. And then (laughs) she'll be like, you know, on the phone late at night. I'm like, come on, it's bedtime. She's like, no, this is my (laughs) self-care. I'm on the phone. (laughs) use it against you huh (laughs) that's cute though but but she's it's the modeling is sinking in for her so it must feel good to know that you're showing your daughter how to take care of yourself without any guilt totally Yeah. yeah yeah and you know also apologizing you know I still do that and sometimes I choose control over intimacy still I mean I'm still new at that Um, And it's not easy. And I know I have that choice, you know, I can still choose it. But when I do, it doesn't sit well with me. Like I notice it now. Um, So usually I choose the apology and that like 30 seconds of horrible, humble pie I have to eat um, for my tiny part, you know, is worth it. It restores the peace. the peace. Um, and he also apologizes a lot now, which he never did. You know, I never expected that. Um, I'm also learning to receive graciously. I never did that. You know, it's like, Oh no, don't worry about it. Or, you know, no big deal. But whether it's receiving a compliment or receiving things, which I never got anyway, but now anything I get, I, I receive it graciously and I make a big deal about it gush over it even if it's something that I don't like and then I get more but I just say thank you a lot I've learned how to duct tape over my mouth um my husband still gets moody a lot you know he's not so angry he doesn't fly into a rage but he'll get moody and I just don't ask him any questions I don't like absorb his mood the way I did it's not my fault I don't I just don't worry about it I just like stay on my own paper 
and let him be, ignore him, just try to be happy and just move on and pretend like nothing's happening. And then he snaps out of it very quickly. Um, he just wants to be around me more. He comes home. He never came home before. Now he's like home a lot more. He even started like talking, <laughs> expresses his thoughts some. He's not like a very talkative person, but he will start talking some. I use spouse fulfilling prophecies, like trying to create things, you know, that I want, you know, what I focus on increases. I see how they are transformative. Like my husband's very orderly. He likes his territory. Um, and I, you know, would love to have guests and mess. We have a lot of kids with grandkids and messy and chaotic. And so I just, oh, I tell him, gosh, you're so easygoing and you're so flexible and you're so hospitable. And, and then all of a sudden he is so like much magic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it that simple to just, you just say it and then he becomes that? I know. I tell, <laughs> it sounds crazy. I know. Are you sure it, this is how I, it works? <laughs> it does. I, I, it's, it's, it's like hocus pocus weird it, it really I know it's honestly I came on this podcast like I'm going to give hope to the women who have been struggling and not seeing results because I, I want them to know not to give up because it doesn't always come so easily the transformation and the change it takes time because it's taking me time but as I'm talking to you I'm seeing like I've had so many great <laughs> things happen like, it sounds miraculous but like really it's not like all perfect and great like no, it does take no. Time. like I'm well, I'm just pointing out the good things but yeah it's not all perfect <laughs> no no and no marriage is perfect my not even my marriage is perfect but but there is something about telling your story uh, like you're doing right now and really focus. You, you've talked about focusing on what you want and how it increases. And that's what we're doing here. We're, you're sort of, you're writing the story the way you want it to be. And I, I, I know that's been powerful for me also. So I kind of hear you um, seeing all this evidence of the good things in your marriage and, and um, it's still a little surprising. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. It's still unfolding. Yeah. I mean, I, I still struggle with vulnerability. It's really hard for me to trust my husband completely. I have a lot of fear. Um, he's even told me he just wishes that I would trust him and be vulnerable. I'm like, where'd you get that from? Are you like reading my Laura Doyle book? Like, <laughs> I, I sent him one. So maybe. Oh, no, no, I, I did it. But um, so like what kinds of things? do you see like where you'd like to be more vulnerable, but it's been scary? Well, with the finances, that's for sure. Like I'm not at graduate level yet. You know, right. I have not right. really pushed the finances and like, I've had thoughts of doing it and I'm like, no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. I mean, just the fact that you're bringing it up because it it's also, it's not, it's not required and you're, always the expert in your own life, you get to decide if it fits and it doesn't fit is what I hear you saying. But I also hear you bringing it up like, oh, I'd like to do that, but I, I don't, but I wouldn't like to do it either at this right. time. It's, it's not the right time for you to do that. No, yeah. no, it's not. It's okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. um, so, so it sounds like he comes home more. I mean, how would you describe your relationship overall though? It's not perfect. I totally get that, but what's it like? Um, so, you know, I'm not like stewing in resentment anymore. I am able to express my desires and he like is so quick to fulfill them now. It's, it's playful. It's, um, there's a lot more affection. Um, there's, is he still, is he still in the guest room? No. Definitely not. No, no. He seeks me out. Um, there's so much more peace. There's no fighting at all. None. There's wow. really no, none? I mean, almost not. Like I could like think of like 
the one or two fights that we've had over like the last like nine months, maybe like I can remember, like we used to fight all the time and like, he's really not even fighting with my son either. Like there's just like, my house is peaceful now. What about all the anger? No, no, he's not angry anymore. No, no, no. He's happy. Like he'll like, be humming or not. and he's he doesn't he shouldn't be <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> he's be so happy <laughs> wait so so your son you and your son used to kind of be on the same team against your husband right is that happening or no no because I don't I won't fall for that like I look at that as bait you know like if he would to come to me and you know to ask dad I'm like you know he's right there go for ask it your, ask your dad go, <laughs> go talk to him so you're kind of out of the middle of that yeah right? yeah or you know I'll I'll just like constantly be like wow dad's so smart or you know, listen to dad like you I, say I really, dad's so smart today? yeah yeah did they like fall out of their chairs when you were saying that? Or? Probably the first time. Yeah. <laughs> so cool, Sharon. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and how has this all impacted your kids? Oh, well, they just seem much more calm. Um, honestly, I feel like one of the biggest relationships that's impacted is with my grandkids surprisingly yeah before like not that long ago they didn't really want to be around me that much i i was critical even of these like cutie pies these precious like innocent children and i didn't even realize it but i started practicing the skills and just like you know staying on my paper and all of a sudden, they are magnetized to me unbelievably. Like, it's incredible. It's like I get my wildest dreams. They like run into my arms. They call me all the time. I'm like, I'm at work. I can't talk right now. <laughs> they have weekly sleepovers. They come snuggle, sit on my lap. They just, they love me. Like, it's, it's a, joy it's like unbelievable and it's just because of these skills it's been transformative and at work also like I used to have issues I mean like I'm in an authority position at work and I felt like I had to assert myself and and now it's like I've learned the skill of vulnerability and it has served me so well my you know my employees they enjoy being around me um, I've just created so much connection. I've created such an incredible culture at work. They're just like magnetized to me and, um, and, and, it, and they are so much more willing to please me and to, I don't have to like assert myself to get them to do what needs to be done. They want to do it. And it like, I had an incredible story. Um, we were having like a battle over the heat because I don't like the having the heat on at work and the girls on the office were so cold. And I was like, Oh my gosh, the beginning of the winter, we're going to have like a battle every single day over the thermostat. And I did not know how to handle it because it was making me feel sick. And I was like, I'm going to practice the skill of vulnerability here. And I called a meeting and I told the girls, I said, you know, I have a problem and I need your help. And they were like, Oh, what? what can we do? I was like, I feel really sick when the heater is on and it's blowing on me, but I know that you're really cold and I don't want you to feel uncomfortable either. What can we do? And we came up with a solution. And previously I would have put a note on the thermostat. Don't touch the thermostat order of the manager, you know? <laughs> I love the tone of voice here. No, don't touch it. <laughs> it's like, I got that little like, eh, you know, it's, don't do it. What was the solution to that? We bought little space heaters for each of them to put next to their desk. And that was it. Oh my gosh. 
I love it. So everyone's happy. They're probably happier yeah. than they were. Right. They can have immediate control. Yeah. Beautiful job illustrating the skill of vulnerability too. I love it. Yeah. So we're oh, and the part about your grandkids, I mean, that is every grandma. I mean, that must just melt you, but every grandma wants that where they just run to you and hug you and can't wait to come to your house. And yeah. so, and you've created that with your grandkids. Yeah. The skills have just changed me so dramatically. Like I never knew that I was in charge of my own happiness. I never knew that. I mean, it's taken me so long to learn that. I can't believe that. I didn't know it was okay to be happy. I didn't know that it was okay to be happy even if my husband is not being the way that I would love him to be. It's amazing, isn't it? Why isn't anyone talking about this? Why is it? How is it we got to be this age without anybody ever saying that or showing us what's possible with that? But, you know, I just commend you so much for finding that pathway yourself. You did yeah. it. Yeah. Um, how else has, how are you different now, Sharon, than you used to be? Um, I'm just relinquishing control over so many things. Like just a lot of things don't bother me. Just staying on my own paper all the time. So many situations. Like for instance, with my son, my, I'm a teenage boy, you know? Recently, we got in the car. His latest thing is he doesn't have to wear a seatbelt. I mean, what? Like, really? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, yeah. so we got in the car. And of course, every time we get in the car, put on your seatbelt, put on your seatbelt, put on your seatbelt. And, and I hope you're putting it on every time you get into someone else's car. You don't know that. Yeah. So anyway, so we get in the car. How was that was working? Like, yeah. Well, right. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't working. Okay. No, not working. So we got in the car. And he doesn't put on a seatbelt. And I just said, okay, I'm going to relinquish control. And I just put on duct tape and I didn't say anything. And we're driving and driving and that whole mile driving. I was like bursting out of my skin. Like I was just dying. I wanted to say something so bad, but I didn't. I didn't say anything. And I was pretending like I didn't notice, like not, you know, he would have never known that I was bursting out of my skin. I was just driving as if nothing's happening. And then very nonchalantly, he just buckled his seatbelt. You're kidding. I was like, oh, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> and inside were you doing a little victory dance? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Absolutely. Here's, he became responsible for himself because you weren't, he didn't hear you reminding him or nagging him to do it. Yeah, yeah. And like my daughter... She's going to bed way too late on the phone and it was like turning into a war. And I was like, you know what? I'm relinquishing control of this too. And I said to her, you know, I trust you to put yourself to bed on time. And she started crying. She's like, you trust me? She's like, that's all I've ever wanted to hear. And I was like, wow, wow. So your relationship with your kids sounds like it's very transformed also yeah wow amazing so and you sound more dignified to me is that right yeah yeah I just feel much better about myself I was so unhappy I had this inner angst needless emotional turmoil like all the time about everything you know like yeah there's people at work that bug me and whatever. And I would go into like all this stuff in my head. And why are they doing that? And why aren't they including me? And why didn't they tell me? And And now I'm just like, who cares? Who cares? (laughs) Like nothing, like let it go. Language control. Like I I just like, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, what is your tip for someone who is, where you were, where the hus- her husband's in the guest room. There's cold wars, there's arguments. He's angry all the time. And it's been a lot of years. And she doesn't, she's full of resentment. She doesn't see a way out. She feels really stuck. And she wants to have him uh, come home, start coming home and 
spending time with her and they laugh together. And he points at her when she's dancing at the, in the kitchen, says, look at the crazy lady dancing in the kitchen. And he buys her presents and wants to make her happy. And she can see that. And um, that they stop arguing. But she wants all the things that you've created, Sharon. How should she start? I would say the first thing is to not give up, not give up hope. It's not easy. It's a, it's a, feels like a bitter pill to swallow, but just don't give up. It's worth it. It's worth it. I mean, it pains me so much now when I see people getting divorced and I see the broken families and how it affects kids. I come from a broken family and it is so heartbreaking. And I just wonder, there's so many families that could be salvaged with these skills. And I just see with my own family, the transformation and I could have given up. I was on the brink of giving up and I've seen so many transformations in my own life, you know, where I've struggled so much in my life, whether it was with my marriage, where I struggled with addiction and these things don't necessarily get resolved quickly and easily, but I've not given up. And this took, this took me a long time to find you, Laura. And even now, even, (laughs) it's not your (laughs) fault, you know, but I'm just so glad I did. And even now that I'm working the skills, like it's not always easy and I'm not always successful and it's not always perfect, but I know I'm on the right track. I know I have a roadmap to success and I know I have so much faith that these skills work. I see them and um, just not to give up, just to keep trying and to latch on to as much support as possible. Like I saw that there's so much support available. Like the book is amazing. It's great. I knew for me, it wasn't enough. Like I have to be all in. I needed every possible type of support. I got a coach. Then I joined the Ridiculously Happy Wife. And now I'm in coach training. Like I need as much support as I can get because I will slip back into my old ways. And I just encourage women to surround themselves with as much support as they possibly can. I've invested more than the resources that I have. I had to beg, borrow, and I haven't stolen, but I've done everything that I I can to to make this work so that I can save my marriage because there's nothing more important than that. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So, so be determined. You're very determined and you got all the support that you could and you had to be creative in your resources to get it. It wasn't just, the money wasn't just sitting there waiting for you like, oh, you know, make this investment. You made it your priority and created that opportunity for yourself. I love that. Because I think there can be a lot of, uh, I mean, I just remember feeling really stuck. Like I couldn't do anything that I wanted. It cost money before because of the mindset I, I had. And I almost needed to, I had to spend the money to get out of the mindset that I didn't have enough money. <laughs> so, um, and I hear you kind of did the same thing for yourself. Yes. What would you say to Sharon, if you could go back in time and tell her what you know now? Um, don't be so afraid. It's okay to, to trust, to trust my husband to yeah i to just not to be so scared i i i never ever ever would have thought of myself as an afraid person i'm so capable so confident and this program has unearthed so many fears that it's underneath everything and now i realize like there's nothing to be afraid of just to trust to trust that he's not there to hurt me yeah Yeah. beautiful and then it sounds like you're trusting all around town you're trusting your your team at work you're trusting your daughter to put herself to bed at the right time and you're trusting your husband so you've grown these trust muscles uh that maybe you didn't used to have you were so capable 
and then to a fault, maybe that you didn't trust others because you didn't need to, because you could do it all yourself, but it was a painful way to live. It sounds like. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sharon, your story is amazing. It's inspiring. You're, you're so authentic. It just is, is very engaging. It's very attractive. I just, I feel like we've been lifelong friends. And, uh, so I wish. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I know. Well, and I know you're inspiring a lot of people who are listening right now who might feel like you did. Like, this is so unfair. I'm so resentful. Why doesn't he have to do the work? And and it's been going on for a long time. And maybe she feels really stuck. Uh, and you're just a great example of um, it's gonna it's gonna take some focus to to make these changes, but, um, they're worth it to get to the other side and to, to feel, it sounds like you feel loved now. I definitely feel loved. I feel cherished. I feel adored all the promises that you've made. I do feel that. And I feel like there's so much more to come. I feel like it's just begun. Yeah. It's a journey. I mean, after 20 years, I feel like I'm still on it. And, and there's always more to learn and it's, it's, it's a kind of exciting. So I hear the same thing from you. Yeah. Well, I love it. This has been really great. I feel just full of gratitude for you and all that you've done to fix your marriage and then share it with us. You are a big contribution to ending world divorce. Oh, and thank you. Um, I heard on the podcast a few months ago, one of the men on the man cast or whatever it was called, and you thanked him and he said, I do anything for you, Laura. And I was like moved to tears. And I was like, you know what? I feel the same way. Like, I feel like you've saved my life and the life of my family. So thank you. Thank you too. If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. And now it's time for the worst relationship advice of the week award. It's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice. Yeah, it's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice of the week. And the advice that's got me chagrined this week is from a social media post. And it says, Dear partner, when you say I'm tired, what I struggle not to hear is dot, dot, dot. And then, to be honest, it gets a little incoherent, which I have to say, that is a major thing that drives me absolutely batty. It makes me want to tape it to a punching bag and start throwing right hooks at it. When you can't even understand the advice, much less know what to do with it, and you're struggling a lot like I was, incoherent relationship advice is the worst. So this fits that bill for me. And I was really trying to understand this advice so I could consider it for this award. So the post says the, quote, who is more tired talk is an exhausting one. Of course, partners want to be able to share They are tired without it turning into a whole thing. It goes on to say, and I quote, but also when our partners say they are tired, it is activating for real and important reasons. And that does not make you crazy or an angry person, unquote. So uh, I think what they're suggesting in that gobbledygook is that when your husband says he's tired, you should respond by saying, when you say I'm tired, what I struggle not to hear is dot, 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 that you don't want to help with bedtime. Or what I struggle not to hear is that you don't see how hard I'm working. Or what I struggle not to hear is that you don't want to have family time. And to be fair to this 
mostly incoherent bad advice. I completely made up those last parts of the the sentences I just read. I mean, it could be anything, I guess, because it's got that dot, dot, dot. Since they mentioned the, quote, who is more tired talk being exhausting, I guess it's something along those lines, but we can never know. So this crummy advice was sent in by a student who writes, this is advice is just atrocious. It excuses complaining to your spouse as long as you tiptoe around your partner's possible emotional response. And the student goes on to say, instead, the wife could show gratitude for all that the husband is doing so that he knows that his efforts are seen and appreciated. And the student also says, and instead of complaining about being tired, she could say exactly the end result that she desires, such as, I would love a nap after lunch so that the husband knows how to help. No spouse wants to be psychologized by the other spouse, which is what these psychologists are suggesting you do. This is a recipe for focusing on what's wrong and therefore leaving everyone demoralized, she writes. And I couldn't agree more. This student not only has a keen eye for terrible relationship advice, she did a great job reaching for powerful intimacy skills to use in this situation instead, which I agree is going to be much more effective for making your marriage last and thrive than reading something negative and offensive into your husband's words when he says, I'm tired. So this is a big shout out to you, anonymous student who sent this in. Thanks for contributing, not only the worst advice winner, but also the skills you could reach for when you're feeling tired and your husband says he's tired. I sure feel the love and I see what a great student of the intimacy skills you are. So thanks for the contribution to the Empowered Wife podcast. I can see where uh, in the bad old days, my husband would say he was tired and I could jump onto his paper and make it mean that he didn't want to talk things out with me. Or I could certainly make it into something negative. I'm just so grateful to not be wasting a lot of time making up negative things that my husband didn't even say so I can tell him I think that's what he means. I know from experience it will definitely not help improve my marriage or help me get what I want, but I could lose a whole lot of dignity and intimacy following this advice. So for that reason, the advice that to say, dear partner, when you say I'm tired, what I struggle not to hear is dot, 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 and then fill it in with a negative projection or criticism is the very, very, very worst relationship advice I have heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, I'll share how to use your feminine gifts in marriage part two. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that we got new windows and they're really hard to open unless you unlock them first.